Welcome back to another episode of the Outsider Sports Baseball Podcast. Corey Jason here, joined with Ben Mandel and Dylan Mel back here. Episode 16 in this young baseball season. And let's start it off with the Las Vegas Athletics. We got a first look at what they're preparing to be, the new stadium on the Las Vegas Strip. And I want to hear your guys' thoughts, though, on a couple of the things they said they're going to be including in this stadium. We got 30,000 seats, a retractable roof, and views of the strip from home plate. And when I hear that, I think of the uh, the bridges and the Allegheny when you, when you go to Pittsburgh and you see that from home plate out through the outfield. Just one of the better skylines in all of sports. Now, the lease in Oakland is up after the 2024 season. But how do you guys think about the about this stadium and what they're proposing? So I have to say I'm a sucker for a good backdrop. I love the backdrop in Pittsburgh. I actually love the backdrop over there at PNC Field in Scranton, or Music, technically, where the Rail Riders play, where it's built into the mountain. Now, I think the strip, it's going to look nice. The artist renderings look beautiful, but the stadium just feels small. 30,000 seats is not big. Uh, typically, you see near 40. Dodger Stadium, I think, holds close to 60,000, right around that mark. So really just small. It's not big. I don't know what they're going for. I think, you know, the success that you've seen with the Raiders and the Golden Knights in Vegas, you would want to build a bigger stadium. But I guess for where they want to put it, that might be the size they can do, especially with the retractable roof. Yeah, I mean, I've been a huge proponent of this move to Vegas for the A's. I mean, I was talking about it before baseball season even started, so I love the move. Love where they're putting the stadium. If you're going to be a Vegas team, show off Vegas. And like Ben said, the Raiders, the Knights, the Aces, they've all proven to be pretty successful during their time in Vegas. And with the rise of sports betting, Las Vegas is going to be the future home to the A's as well as an NBA team in the future. Vegas is about to be a sports city, and the A's are going to go from irrelevant to relevant very quickly with this move, in my opinion. The one thing I I just don't know about with this is if Vegas is ready for baseball, football is an event, basketball an event, hockey is an event, baseball is 162 games long, that's 81 home games in Las Vegas. I don't know if not a local crowd, it's more of a, uh, a what's it called, visitors really. I don't know if people coming into Vegas are going to go for an Oakland A's game. You know what I mean? Especially when the Dodgers and the Angels are a decently short drive, I believe four hours away. So I, I think that's going to be the one concern is it's going to be novel the first two or three years, but after that, Are they going to be able to keep it up? And I think with the 30,000 seats, they're trying to make a smaller, compact stadium to make it look like they're selling out and getting more people when other stadiums are closer to 40, if not more. I One thing I do want to add, because I know, Dylan, you said you like this move. I really don't. I, I do agree. I think I like the stadium. But the athletics it's not a problem with their fan base their fan base is not the issue it's not like you need to drum up excitement around this team this team has refused to give or invest anything and the city is tired and doesn't want to put anything back what what problems do you think that's going to cause in Vegas where there's going to be a higher demand and you're going to have to spend more money? The fact that they made it a 30,000 seat stadium shows me that they aren't setting the expectations high. And you know what? It also shows me that they're cheap. They're trying to afford to build the stadium and making it smaller. It really does bother me. I think this is an organization that cuts corners wherever they can. And, you know, an ownership group that, isn't necessarily invested in the product on the field so much as making money. And that's an issue for the sport. And that's the real problem with Oakland. That's the problem with the athletics organization, not the city, not the fan base, but the ownership group. Yeah, I think that's certainly a real concern there. Um, I just want to touch on Corey. You said a four-hour drive, not too far. I, I don't know, man. Four-hour drive for a baseball game seems kind of far, especially – 
you know, all the way through LA traffic and everything, it could be a problem. But when you're out in Vegas, you're out in Vegas, though, ready to do all those things. So it's a different type of mindset. Yeah, it's definitely a different type of mindset. But now the comfortability of just being able to do it in Vegas will be excellent. I think Vegas will be a sports town. And to speak on what Ben was saying about the ownership group, you know, here's what we could hope. Let's hope that they treat it like a New Year's resolution. You know, when you finally say, I'm going to start going to the gym and you go for that first week or two. The problem is not everybody sees results and can hold to it. Hopefully the AAC sees results immediately and then they stick to it. I think they can attract free agents in Vegas, but let's see if they're willing to pay up and spend. We'll have to wait and see. And none of this rendering of the new stadiums even guaranteed. We know how that likes to shake out where budget and time constraints kick in and it turns into a shell of what it's supposed to be. Willie Adamas, the Brewers shortstop, he went to the IL, I don't know if you guys saw, with a concussion after being hit in the head with a foul ball while standing in the dugout. A really scary sight. Thankfully, he's okay, but you always got to have your head on a swivel paying attention to your surroundings. Kansas City's left fielder Edward Olivares hit a home run the other day. A game-tying home run, by the way, in the eighth inning versus the Nationals. And he hit it so hard that it hit the scoreboard, and the scoreboard broke and started smoking. Talk about a ball being smoked, no pun intended. Just a ridiculous sight to see a ball being hit into the scoreboard is one thing. Then for the scoreboard to actually break and then start smoking in itself, that's one of those where were you moments when you're at the game. Yeah, for sure. That was like my exact thought there, Corey. You know, if I was at the game and I was relatively close to the scoreboard, my immediate thought would have been, well, geez, thank God that didn't go a lot worse for me. But really, that's just one of those one in a billion type moments where it's like, wow, I'm, it's crazy. I got to witness that in person for the people that were there. Now, this is something I want to hear your guys' thoughts on. Yankee skipper Aaron Boone was suspended for a game for his recent actions against umpires, Boone likes to get thrown out of games. It happens. He's a very passionate man. He likes to defend his players. And I feel whether you like him or not, that is one of his best qualities is that he's always willing to get out there and defend his players right or wrong. He likes to get everybody fired up. Now, I think the league is being soft for suspending him. I don't think there's any need for it. If you want to say it's because some spit got on the umpire, to that, I say, quit crying. Who cares? Because he didn't spit on the umpire on purpose. Just some spittle came out and went everywhere. It happens when you're having a conversation with somebody. Spit gets out and flies. It happens. You get hit. Sucks, but it's not on purpose. I think the main issue is the league needs to look at why is Boone actually arguing? And yes, a lot of it is balls and strikes and even rules being utilized improperly but let's be fair if you look back at the calls he's arguing he tends to be right almost every time and it's not ticky tack borderline calls it's really big egregious stuff that really just shouldn't be happening at this level of play yeah Corey, you mentioned it you know as a fellow yankee fan we love seeing judge go to bat for our players he's a real players manager that's why the players love him and he was actually on talking yanks the day before he got the suspension that led to him or the ejection that led to him being suspended and they said oh are you trying to break your season record of 10 ejections in a season and he said no no i hate being ejected and it was just really odd timing because the very next day ejected and suspended but yeah i mean the suspension's ridiculous like you said a lot of the times he ends up being right and i get it like, the way that this works is you can't just go out there and be aggressive over and over and over again. These umpires are human. They're going to make mistakes. It happens. But at the same time, if he's right, why is he being suspended additional time? He was already punished. He was ejected from the game. Uh, it's unfair to me, and Aaron Judge has one of the craziest strike zones I've ever seen, but I'll leave it at that. Look, you can be as mad as you want to be at the strike zone. Everybody is dealing with this. And you know what? The bottom line is 
these umpires being as stubborn and soft as they are is the reason why robo umps are going to come in because they refuse to take any criticism they refuse to take any kind of responsibility they're it's unacceptable and you know what you can argue that you don't want to see robo umps but these umpires are the reason why you know everybody makes mistakes we get that own up and take responsibility. Don't sit there and double down and triple down after you've seen the fact. You know what? Remember when uh, Armando Galarraga, however many years ago it was at this point, had the perfect game lost after that safe call at first base, even though he was out by a step, and the umpire went up to him, crying, hugged him, and apologized the next day. He took responsibility because he knew he messed up. There wasn't any screaming. There wasn't any arguing like this. You know what? Umpires need to just own up, stop being so soft, take responsibility, and realize that, you know what? You messed up. We get it. Acknowledge it. We move on. Don't keep making the same bad call. And stop acting like you're perfect and you're always right. Yeah, umps are, umps are rough. It's just, I, I just don't understand why they have uh, almost like a God complex or a Napoleon complex. They can't ever be wrong. And sometimes all it takes is them to say, you know, my bad, I got it wrong. And it sucks, but most people are able to move on past that if you don't do it again. But to double down, it's just ridiculous. 27 hits, though, 21 runs in the Tampa Bay versus Dodgers series. Those umps had to put in some work. Long game there. Tampa Bay won 11 to 10. But that's a lot of runs and a lot of hits, especially for some really good teams that – whose staffs don't really give up that many runs or hits. So it's just weird to see it with them and not, you know, Kansas City, Oakland in a game against each other where nobody can get any outs. Tyler Glass now, speaking of the Rays, he's back at home in Tropicana pitching for the first time in 718 days. He got Tommy John surgery in 2021 after that crackdown and sticky stuff. He should have sued Manfred, in my opinion, because that is a direct workplace uh, in directed injury. Wouldn't have happened without the stupid crackdown that made no sense. And then in February of this past year, he got an oblique strain, which knocked him out until now. Came back for a couple starts at the end of last season, but those were on the road. But Glasnow is one of the good guys in baseball, a very good pitcher. So it's nice to see him back in front of his home crowd after so long. But let's have a little discussion on the front runner for the National League MVP, Ronald Acuna Jr. of the Atlanta Braves. He's on pace for a 40-40 season. This would be the first 40-40 season since Alfonso Soriano in 2008. Barry Bonds, A-Rod, and Jose Canseco are the only other ones, only four people ever achieved a 40-40 season. And you know what that? Those four also made it a 50-40 season. So nobody's ever achieved a pure 40-40 season without going up to the 50 home run mark. Ronald Acuna is on pace for that. He's also on pace, though, to be the first ever 30-60 season. 30 home runs, 60 stolen bases, never before done, not even by a guy like Ricky Henderson. Nobody in the 20s, the 30s, going back to the 1800s when – Inside the Parkers were all the rage. Nobody achieved a 30-60 season. So if he's able to keep pace and do that, that would be pretty incredible. Yeah, Corey, and this really stems, in my opinion, from the new rule changes, the bigger bases, the limited pickoffs, and that plays to a guy like Ronald Acuna's strengths. And he was already one of the best players in all of baseball. But now certain skills of his have been exaggerated by the new rule changes, and I'm not complaining about it. I think it's great that we have all this additional action in baseball, but part of its skill, part of it's the new rule changes. And Acuna, in my opinion, is definitely going to hit this 40-40 mark as long as he can stay healthy, which we know has been a concern in the past. Now, let's go on, though, because Acuna has been a stud, but we have a couple of our own this week. Let's go to some studs and duds. My stud this week, Astros starting pitcher Framber Valdez. In 15 innings, he went 2-0, and had a complete game shutout, eight hits, one earned run, three walks, 12 strikeouts, just a completely dominating performance this week. Also scored the most fantasy points in my fantasy league, not for my team, sadly, but the most over the last week. My dud, the Tigers starting pitcher, 
Joey Wentz, six innings. He went 0 and 2. So that's six innings with two starts combined. 16 hits, 11 earned runs, two walks, five strikeouts. Plus, he did that poorly versus the White Sox and the Nationals, two of the worst teams in all of baseball. But, Ben, let me hear your stud and your dud. My stud, Wander Franco with the Rays. He's been one of the best offensive shortstops in baseball this season. Kept it up this week, 10 for 26. Uh, eight singles, but two triples to go along with that. Just four RBIs, but four stolen bases. My dud, it's Kyle Tucker. And while he did have eight RBIs this week, just five hits, all five were singles, and only one run scored. No walks for him. Just a tough week for someone who you expect to really excel. Not to knock Kyle Tucker. He's having a strong season, but a bad week for him. He's my dud this week. Yeah, and my stud this week is Luis Castillo, the ace of the Seattle Mariners, and he really earned that title this past week. 12 innings pitched, a 2-0 and record. He had 18 strikeouts over that stretch, only four walks, and he was just an absolute beast on the mound for Seattle, a team that is looking to climb in a competitive AL West division. And my dud this week, Andres Jimenez. This is a guy that's known for hitting for average, and simply put, this past week he didn't. Four for 19 this week, only one run scored. The four hits were all singles, nothing for extra bases. It was just a rough week, but, you know, when you have a rough week, you earn the title of dud. Now, with those studs and duds, other teams were playing this week, and we're going to head into some of our rankings. Ben, I got a big question for you, though. San Fran made their debut in your rankings. Can you give me some thoughts on why you included them for the first time? Yeah, and this is also going to stem in with one of the teams that fell out for me because they were the two teams vying for that final spot, and it's the Miami Marlins and San Francisco Giants. The New York Mets can go into this category as well. I think all three of those teams are interchangeable at this point, but in their last 10 games, Miami's 5-5. Five and five. The Mets, after losing to the Rockies today, uh, are 6-4 and four in their last 10. San Fran is 7-3. and three. They've gotten themselves into the last wild card spot. The Mets find themselves a half game behind Miami right now. And, you know, I think these three teams, they're currently all on the same level. They're wild card level teams. They're not going to compete really for the division the way it looks, but I think they'll fight for playoff spots. But, you know, when you look at San Francisco, they're finding ways to win games. I don't necessarily love the way they do it. I don't see them being a team that sticks around, but I am going to give credit where credit's due for them. And that is putting them in the top 10 with this recent stretch going 7-3 and three in their last 10 games and finding their way into a playoff spot currently. Do you have anything more to say about the Mets, though? They were playing pretty well, and everybody seemed to be on top of the world. And you had Verlander pitching on Saturday, struggling. What seems to be their issue is, is Vogelback, you know, playing too much? Why isn't Buck playing the kids more? Just what's going on in Queens? Is Buck an issue? I don't think Buck's an issue. I think Buck is still kind of working some kinks out. I think this isn't necessarily an easy roster to work with right now. I think you're a little handcuffed with pitching when pitching was expected to be a strength. I think that... You know, Verlander and Scherzer, I'm not so worried about them because we're seeing good things out of them as well. I think they'll be okay. I, I like the kids, though. I think Vientos and Alvarez are going to start playing more. I think Alvarez has that dog in him. He's really been very good uh, since coming up, and especially the last seven games. He's been outstanding. He's someone who could have fought his way into that stud spot this week if he had played a bit more. I think he's really starting to find himself. I think the kids are getting more comfortable. You do still need to see more uh, out of them, though, before they can become regulars. You have to realize guys like Vogelback and Escobar, you know, they are veterans. They are guys who still can play and on other teams go in and slot in and are starters. you got to also realize how hard it is to play in New York sometimes. Speaking of New York, we're going to get to some Yankee talk with Dylan. But first, Dylan... The Brewers were in your top 10, and so were the Mariners. Can you give a little explanation to why the Brewers, who have really struggled and now lead the the, the worst division of all of baseball, why they still kept to be in your top 10? And also the Mariners, who just got into third place, but they're still you know lower in their division than some others. What, what's the thinking there? 
Yeah, Corey. So it's really a tale of two separate teams here. For the Milwaukee Brewers, they are the top of the NL Central right now at 28 and 25. And I do still like their pitching. While they haven't really put it together, they're leading that division. The Cardinals were a team that we thought would be leading that way. But right now, they have a playoff spot secured. And you have to respect a team that's leading their division somewhat. As well, I'm a guy who's an AL American League fan. And I know we got some talk going on about that, but I wanted to make sure to not have any AL bias, had to include some additional NL teams, and a team that's leading the division in the Brewers and has some real good players, you know, they made their way into the top 10 for me. As well for Seattle, you guys know that I've been shooting my shot, calling my shot with teams, maybe sneaking them into the top 10 a little earlier. But when I see the rise that's about to come, I have to give it to them, right? So the Seattle Mariners, 28 and 25. They're 7 and 3 in their last 10. They're now a plus 37 run differential on the season. You have J Rod. You have Luis Castillo, who got my stud of the week. And this is a team that some people had going all the way to the World Series this year. Baseball's a long haul. They got off to a rough start, but I think the Mariners are slowly going to creep their way into more conversations of top 10 over the next month or so. Now, Dylan, let me hear some Yankee talk. The Yankees, they started off all right, then kind of went in a rut. We're one of the best teams in baseball throughout the month of May, but they seem to have stumbled starting with Baltimore and now into this Padre series going 3-3 three and three over this homestand. But what's going on in Yankee land? What do you think? Yeah, so the Yankees are 7-3 and three over their last 10, and, you know, they're getting healthier, more starting pitching. Luis Severino back had two really solid starts for the Yankees. They took care of business, sweeping the Cincinnati Reds. You know, that's a team where you got to get those wins against bad competition. Then you run into a Baltimore team who I'm guessing everybody has in the top five of their rankings right now. You don't win that series. You go one and two, but then you go two and one versus a Padres team who, while their record may not show it, everybody knows they're a dangerous team. This Yankees team, they've got guys that are stepping up, like Isaiah Kiner Falefa, who's had a really big past week, not stud level, but really big for what he's doing. Anthony Rizzo batting over 300 right now. Aaron Judge, you look down at your phone, get that ESPN notification every night that he's hit a home run, it seems, up to 15 on the season. And Garrett Cole still in Cy Young conversations. Now, if the Yankees can get Carlos Rodon back, get a little bit healthier everywhere else, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen with Josh Donaldson when he comes back, but clearly this team's not in its final form yet. Hanging around in a really tough AL East division right now, I like where we're at. Now, I've got to ask you both some questions. Take your turns answering. First up, how big is the gap between Tampa Bay and the rest of the league? Tampa's been pretty consistent at number one of the rankings for us. We've seen Atlanta be there the most. The Dodgers have gotten some time there. A lot of people have Baltimore at number two now. How big is the gap between Tampa and everybody else? I don't think the gap is necessarily as big as it seems. I think Tampa has just been the most consistent of the teams, and part of that is the way that they're run and the way that they're managed. They have a good manager. They have a style that holds up throughout the regular season. It has gotten them to the World Series. Is it necessarily the best team? No, but it is the team that gets the most wins, and it's a team that can consistently continue to win because of the way that they play. Yeah, I mean, I think the gap is certainly starting to close from their historic start to the season, but they're still an excellent team in baseball and deserve to be number one in everyone's rankings. Like Ben said, they're super consistent, but Yandy Diaz batting 327, 12 homers, a Rosarena. 39 RBIs. And I mentioned Garrett Cole as a Cy Young candidate, but Shane McClanahan, eight starts, eight wins, a 197 ERA, 75 strikeouts, averaging 10 and a half per game. This guy has been on an absolute tear to open up the season for Tampa, and they deserve to be number one in everyone's power rankings. Last question I have for you guys. Is the National League basically just a league of mid-teams or... Are they a bunch of good teams beating up on everybody? The gap between the best team, the Braves, and the worst team, the Rockies, is only nine games. Meanwhile, the AL East, the gap between the first place Rays and the last place Blue Jays is ten and a half games. Meanwhile, the Blue Jays would also be first place in the AL and NL Central. So with that said, is the National League just 
average beating up on each other or are they just a bunch of better than average teams a bunch of good teams playing against each other and bringing each other down what do you guys think yeah so i don't think the nl is just a bunch of mid-level teams right the dodgers and braves clearly sit at the top they are top tier world series contenders and then you got another level of teams where they're overachieving or about where we think that they should be but then there's some really talented rosters thus far that are just underachieving. We talked about the Padres, talked about the Mets, talked about the Cardinals, talked about the Phillies who were just in the World Series. None of those teams are over 500 right now. Baseball is a long haul. If the playoffs were to start today, yeah, it's Braves, Dodgers, and everybody else that's fending for a spot. Whereas in the AL, you could seriously make a case for about six teams right now if the playoffs were to start today to be able to make the World Series. So the AL definitely holds the top tier teams right now, but let's see where it's at come the end of the season. Yeah, you're not wrong with this being a long season, but I do think that the NL has some contenders that haven't necessarily shown their true colors yet. But when you look at the National League, you're right. It is just a lot of mid teams. The NL Central, mid. At least the AL Central has the Twins and the Guardians who are supposed to be good, but the NL Central, even the Brewers and Cardinals, they just look mid. They don't look that great. The Cardinals, I think, will end up winning the division still. They're starting to put some wins together. I think the NL East is good. I think the Mets are a good team. I think the Marlins are a good team. I think the Phillies, I, they have no pitching. Um, like, even Nolan Wheeler can't seem to figure it out. Suarez has been a disaster since he's come back from injury. But the National League just doesn't have the firepower and the star power, frankly, that the American League has. And you can look at the NFL and what the AFC is to the NFC with quarterbacks. I think it's it's fairly similar to what we're seeing in terms of star power in baseball. While the National League has some stars, I think a majority of the bigger stars and the better stars are over in the American League. For me, I just think that the National League is a bunch of good teams. Now, good has a range. The Braves aren't the same good as, I would say, the Rockies. But the Rockies are not a bad team by any stretch. Again, we saw them saw that with them beating up the Mets. It's still early in the season, but I think a lot of the teams in the National League are better than average or average, and that's why it's bringing a lot of some of the teams down into more of a neutral 500 record type. Most teams in the National League are on pace to get close to 500, if not a little below. And I think that's just a testament to how well the teams are built because every team there is built with some form of contention to win. Unlike the American League, that's so top-heavy, you have teams like the A's and the White Sox and the Royals really driving things down, which allows teams like the Rays, the Yankees, the Astros, the Orioles to all blossom up and have bigger records when they face these teams. But I want to ask you guys also, what are some games you guys want to highlight this upcoming week? I know for me, the Angels travel to Houston for a divisional matchup. Otani to the Cheaters. Just, it's a very big thing. The Angels have been good to start the year off. The Astros started off poorly, but they've come into their own as of late. Like Dylan mentioned a few weeks ago, they're going to get there. And now they've gotten there and they're moving on up. The Angels are a very good team. The Astros are really getting back to their form. And I think just seeing these two guys battle it out, it'll one, tell you if the Angels are actually for real, especially against a team in their division. But it'll also tell you if Houston isn't just beating up on poorer teams like we've seen them do against Oakland this past weekend. And if they can really get against some of the better teams in baseball like the Angels have been. But what about you guys? What are some series you guys want to highlight? I am going to stick with a divisional matchup, and it's over in the American League Central with the Guardians and Twins. This is a huge series for Cleveland. This is a team that made the playoffs last year. Everyone expects them to win the division again this year with, you know, the White Sox being what they are. But, you know, the Twins have gotten better. The Twins have control of the division right now. Can the Guardians bounce back and claw their way back. It starts now. They're below 500 right now, but they can definitely make up some ground and make this 
manageable heading into June and put themselves in a good spot. It really is Memorial Day when you need to start kicking things into gear if you are going to compete. This is the cutoff. This is go time. If you do not get your season going and get yourself back to or above 500 by the end of June, then your season is likely done and you are going to become sellers at the deadline because this is this is it. This is go time. So I'm looking forward to this weekend series with Cleveland and Minnesota. I think that it's going to be really telling for this race in the American League Central if Cleveland's going to be able to get themselves back into it and compete with Minnesota. Yeah, and somebody had to do it. So I'll be the guy that picks the weekend series, the MLB's marketing dream come true. The New York Yankees travel to Los Angeles to take on the Dodgers. I mean, just a battle of two juggernaut franchises and two teams that are roughly at the same point in the season right now, record-wise. The Dodgers are 32-22 and with a plus-50 run differential, and the Yankees are 32-23 and with a plus-27 run differential. The Stars will be out in L.A., You know, you got Aaron Judge traveling to the big city of Los Angeles. I mean, is this a World Series preview? We can have that conversation. And anytime you can have that conversation, that is the series that I am locked into. All right. That's going to do it here for the Outsider Sports Baseball Podcast. Check out the website, outsidersports.net. Twitter, Outsider Sports 3, the YouTube and TikTok. Just search up Outsider Sports for some content. Keep listening to the great stuff we got going on. Baseball is going to keep on rolling. 